My favorite afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming here today. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce Alan Hedlis as our car speaker today. Alan is one of the foundational experts in Bayesian modeling and astronomy, astrophysics. Uh, he obtained his PhD from Cambridge in 1983. Um, and then later on, was professor at Edinburgh for 10 years and is now at Imperial College, where I did my undergraduate. Um, and has been the director of the Institute for Inference and Cosmology during this time. And today, Alan will be talking about perfect cosmology. Oh, thanks very much, Rob. Am I all right with microphone? Is that okay? Uh, thank you for the introduction. I, I reread my title and I couldn't quite understand what I was thinking when I when I made it. So I was just trying to reconstruct what I meant by this. I think. Um, uh, the uh, the theme of my talk is is mostly to do with gravita weak gravitational lensing, which is what I spend most of my time doing, and that's the imperfect data part. So this is uh, these small distortions of background images uh, due to the passage of light through a clumpy universe. Uh, and the perfect cosmology bit, I think, what I meant by that was um, as the data gets better with things like the Euclid satellite coming and with LSST, um, you have to do a really careful job because the data are complicated the error bars are extremely small and if you if you don't do as good a job at the analysis stage as the data then you're going to make mistakes so uh, that that was the aim i think i think that's what i had in mind when i put the title together um so i wanted to give a wait to try and move my slide on uh, so the outline of the talk will be to just give a, a little bit of background, of cosmological background, uh, principally for people who don't work in cosmology, um, and then talk a little bit about the way that we analyze data. And this is this is more general, um, but I wanted to compare the standard approaches to doing inference uh, or parameter estimation, if you like, uh, what the challenges are, uh, which are generally to do with the statistics and to do with systematics and how you how you deal with complications in the data. Uh, and then go on to talk about Bayesian principled ways of doing things. So to, to try to, uh, you know, try to do the analysis in, a, in as correct a way as possible with the aim of trying to get the, uh, as much out of the data as, uh, as, as, as you can. And as we'll perhaps see from earlier on, the, the, uh, uh, the challenges are that when we, looking at different cosmological models that the effect on the data uh, is pretty subtle um, there are very small changes that we're looking for if we're going to answer questions about the, the the nature of dark energy or whether Einstein's gravity is the right gravity model uh, the, the the differences are really really small um, so if you don't do as good a job with the statistics as as possible then it's uh, you're unlikely to discover new physics uh, or else you might think that you've discovered new physics, whereas in fact it's because you've not done the, the analysis to, uh, uh, to, too well. So, so the two the two Bayesian approaches that that we follow are uh, come under the headings of Bayesian hierarchical models and simulation based inference. And I was going to spend most of the time uh, in this section talking about SBI, uh, largely because um, this is a somewhat more established technique. I'll say something about it, but. Um, uh, and and in, in some ways, it's the sort of gold standard, I would say, in, in, in trying to do things as properly as possible. Um, this is relatively new, but it has some advantages for dealing with uh, more complicated data sets that have more complicated systematics in. Uh, and uh, as I'm sure all of you know, data is always complicated and always has effects in it that are uh, not necessarily very easy to, to model. Um, and I wanted to give an example. We're doing some work in gravitational lensing in this, in this, uh, with this way. And I was hoping that we would have some, uh, some results by now, which uh, we are almost there. So I'm going to give an example from supernova cosmology to show you how SBI can work uh, extremely effectively. Um, so just some a bit of general background. First, the cosmological model. This is uh, the standard cosmological model that we seems to be a very good description of the universe uh we are of course looking to see whether it's really really a good description or if there are places where it's creaking a little bit and there are a couple um so the universe is almost isotropic and homogeneous it started with the big bang 
controlled by Einstein gravity. It contains cold dark matter, baryons, photons, and traces of other stuff. Uh, it has a large component in the energy density, which is identified with the cosmological constant. Uh, and it has some perturbations in it, which we think arose during inflation in the early universe. And those fluctuations are adiabatic and almost Gaussian. And there's, there's strong evidence for uh, for all of these things. Um, so the standard model on large scales, I think, works uh, uh, works extremely well with a couple of caveats. Um, <clears throat> and if you do parameter inference in this within the context of this model, then you can determine the, the parameters of the model. And uh, the most precise measurements have come largely from Planck data, usually uh, augmented with, with other observations. And we know these cosmological parameters to percent level accuracy, um, percent level precision, should I say. <clears throat> um, so one of the things that we uh, that we now concentrate on is to say, all right, is, is this model, is this it? You know, is, there, is, the, is, that, uh, is, is that really the model? Um, and the thing that we focus on perhaps most is uh, the dark energy part of this. So... Uh, to a very good approximation, it does look like Einstein's cosmological constant, which uh, you can interpret in another way as a vacuum energy density. So if the, if the, if the vacuum has an energy density, then on large scales, that looks just like a, 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 cos a cosmological constant. Um, and a cosmological constant is, or well, vacuum energy is, uh, corresponds to a, a fluid with an equation of state, which is P is minus rho c squared. So uh, one of the standard ways to generalize the uh, so-called lambda CDM model is to allow the dark energy properties to vary, um, to allow the equ equation of state uh, to, to vary away from P equals minus rho c squared. And one, the simple, simplest way to do this is to parameterize it in a phenomenological way uh, by uh, saying that the pressure is W rho c squared and W is uh, minus one but you can allow it to vary and then see if uh, if there's any evidence for it um, varying away from minus one. Uh, if it if if there is convincing evidence for that, then it means that this stuff is a dynamical entity. It's a it's it, it's not a cosmological constant, which you can interpret as being just a feature of uh, of the law of gravity. Um, if if it's uh, if it's a dynamically evolving stuff, then it's it's a source term. So for those of you who know some general relativity, it, if it's uh, if it's stuff, then it sits on the right-hand side as a source of gravity. Uh, if it's a cosmological constant, then you can put it on the left-hand side and say this is just this is just the law of gravity, basically. Uh, <clears throat> so deviations of W from minus one would be uh, very significant. Okay, so the model works um, very well, but as I'm sure you're aware, there's a couple of places where there's uh, some some evidence um, that it's not quite the final answer. And uh, one comes from the Hubble constant. Uh, so there's two ways you can do this. If you analyze cosmological data from the CMB, then you have a theoretical model that includes H as one of the parameters, or H naught as one of the parameters. Um, and you fit essentially fit observations at high redshift or data that has come from high redshift uh, and uh, you infer the current expansion rate from fitting the whole model at much earlier redshift uh, or much higher redshift. Um, and if you do that, then uh, from Planck, you get a, an H naught of about 67 with a, quite a small error. Um, but if you look locally at the expansion rate from supernovae and Cepheids, calibrated with Cepheids, then you get this much higher answer. Um, and these are formally at something like five sigma uh, tension. Um, so that's a, one of the uh, open questions, whether this is a real discrepancy or is there something in either data set which is, uh, uh, which is uh, messing up the answers. Uh, if it's right, then it means that lambda CDM is not the, uh, is not the final, uh, final answer and there must be something, uh, something different to, to change it. And there are many suggestions about what you might change, but none of them appears entirely satisfactory. Uh, just to say that if you do local measurements of the Hubble constant, uh, then uh, you don't necessarily get such a high tension. So here's Planck here. Uh, this is Shoes, which is the Cepheids plus uh, 
Pantheon supernovae uh, showing this discrepancy. But if you use the tip of the red giant branch uh, to calibrate, then uh, you don't get such a big uh, discrepancy. Um, so there's interesting things, I think, coming up, particularly with JWST, where there will be many more of the calibrators uh, observed. Um, and so one can expect lots of developments in this analysis. And it would be very interesting to see where that settles. Um, and, uh, if, it, if it settles down here, then that probably points to something being wrong with the SEBI calibration. Anyway, that's an open question, but um, for this purpose, uh, the only point I want to make is that uh, uh, we need to make sure that we've done the analysis of both of these things um, uh, well so that we're sure in these results. Uh, the other tension, which is not quite so severe, is the so-called S8 tension. That's a combination of the degree of clustering of the matter, which is um, parameterized by this sigma eight uh, quantity. Uh, and there's a dependence on, on omega matter. This quantity is determined much better than either of these two from weak gravitational lensing, because uh, this is a typical plot uh, from various weak lensing surveys that uh, shows that what you infer is a, a degenerate combination of sigma eight and omega matter is, is uh, determined much more precisely than omega matter and sigma eight independently. So S8 is basically uh, measuring the uh, distance along that, uh, uh, across the banana shape there. So that is determined much more precisely than the individual ones. Um, and what you see here, I think I've got another slide, so I'll, I'll show you the tension in a moment. Uh, maybe it's coming up a bit later, but uh, but basically, there's a, there's a, a, a better slide later. But this is this is what Planck gives you, and this is what these various other surveys gives you give you. And there's a bit of an offset, which is more uh, more obvious in the slide, which I'll show later. <clears throat> okay, so. <clears throat> How do we how do we use cosmological data to tell us about the cosmological parameters? Where where is the sensitivity to the physics in this? And uh, there's basically two ways that uh, cosmology affects observations, and this is true of large scale structure observations, uh, weak lensing observations, uh, the CMB. That there are two things that can be probed by cosmological observations. One is the geometry of the universe. Uh, and the other is the growth of fluctuations in the universe. Um, so by the geometry, then I'm typically looking at the, uh, the, the angular sizes of objects, such as fluctuations of the CMB here. Uh, if you change the cosmology, then the angular sizes of the uh, fluctuations change. Uh, so you can, you can compare what's observed with, uh, with the theory. Um, also, the luminosity distance of standard candles like supernovae uh, also depends um, on the uh, on the geometry of the universe as well. So two things we can look at, angular diameter distances of standard rulers and luminosity distances of standard candles. And they, the detailed dependence of that depends on cosmology, principally through this distance redshift relation. Uh, it's a bit more complicated for a non-flat universe, but for a flat universe, it, it's essentially uh, this, the distances are probing the Hubble expansion rate uh, over time. And pretty much everything is connected to, the, or the, the sensitivity to cosmological parameters is, is uh, to a very large degree uh, controlled by how the universe expands with, with, with time. So it's H of Z, which is a, a key quantity that tells us uh, how we can measure things. And this quantity uh, in the Lambda CDM model is, uh, uh, actually this is a more general model where the, uh, the dark energy equation of state is not necessarily minus one, uh, but this quantity depends on the method density uh, the curvature in the non flat case and the amount of dark energy and also its equation of state. So that's where we see that we have some sensitivity to the properties of dark energy 
uh, through the expansion rate of the universe as a function of redshift. <clears throat> and that and this distance, uh, you can then from this you can then get the angular diameter distances and the luminosity distances. So we have sensitivity to physics from uh, from measurements of uh, geometrical objects. Um, so, for example, the supernova Hubble diagram is the, uh, one of the one of the ways to do this. We have standardizable candles um, that we can then use uh, and uh, look at the confront the data with the uh, with the models. Um, so these different theoretical curves correspond to different amounts of dark matter. Um, and uh, dark energy. <clears throat> um, so this is from the uh, earliest papers where the dark energy, the amount of dark energy and the amount of dark matter were constrained uh, to the region in the top left. And the first uh, evidence really that the universe was accelerating. So that's using a standard candle. We can also use uh, standard rulers. So we know in the early universe that the, the sound waves can propagate through the photon baryon mixture uh, in the early universe uh, and with a sound speed that varies with time. Um, and what happens in, is shown here. If you had a, uh, an overdense region, then a sound wave can propagate outwards. And in the early universe, when the photons and baryons are coupled through Thompson scattering, then uh, the photons and the gas move together like this. But then at some point when recombination happens, the photons are no longer coupled to the gas. Um, and uh, um, the, so the, the photons stream away uh, outwards and the gas basically stalls um, at a distance which is about 150 megaparsecs away from, uh, from the initial disturbance. Uh, so this is what this is a sort of Green's function, I suppose. We have some spectrum of fluctuations that uh, makes the situation more complicated. But the uh, the point remains that you expect to see a slight over density of matter that is at about 150 megaparsecs away from uh, any uh, uh, sort of concentration of mass. Uh, so you can still you can detect this statistically in the distribution of galaxies. Um, as an excess of pairs at a particular distance. So this measurement of the correlation function is, um, gives you the excess number of galaxies. Uh, and you see this very clear bump. This is from FOSS data um, at about 100 H to the minus one megaparsec. So at about the right, the right stage. So, uh, so this is basically a standard ruler and you can look at it at different distances and see if it's consistent. Its angular size is consistent with the uh, with, with the standard cosmological parameters, uh, and you can infer the, par the parameters from it. You can also look at radial, the the, the radial uh, baryon acoustic oscillations as well. <clears throat> um, so again, it gives us a way, a handle to measure the redshift distance relation, uh, and hence the dark energy properties. And you can also generalize it to look at different gravity models as well, if you if you want. <clears throat> okay, so the, so the geometry of the universe is affected by the cosmological parameters, uh, also the perturbations, in particular the growth rate and the shape of the of the fluctuation spectrum depend on the uh, on the parameters. Um, so the shape is determined by early universe physics. The growth rate is determined at least to linear order by this equation, where the delta is the fractional over density. And uh, what you see is that the, the equation involves h of z here. So uh, if you change the parameters, you change the growth rate as well. So that's something if you look at if you look at the clustering strength of, in the CMB or in uh, galaxies that you can probe the growth rate as well. And it's the same thing in weak gravitational lensing. So there's these two two key ways where the physics is related to what we what we can observe, and uh, that's um, uh, that's how we're able to determine these parameters with remarkably high precision for the CMB. You can look at the power spectrum of the CMB from Planck, and it fits uh, the Lambda CDM model remarkably well. 
uh, for a particular set of parameters. And if you vary the parameters, then these the theoretical predictions will uh, will, will change and essentially vary them until you get the best fit with the data would give you um, your most probable uh, parameters. Uh, so that all looks well and good. Um, everything looks fine. Um, we, <clears throat> we can also use cosmic shear. Uh, so one of the disadvantages of the CMB is that the sensitivity to dark energy properties is quite limited, um, largely because the dark energy, because it's like a vacuum energy, it's energy density stays constant, whereas the matter density goes down as the universe expands and the radiation density goes down even faster. So if you look at the early universe, then you're dominated completely by matter and radiation. And the late universe is now dominated by lambda. So, so looking at the CMB, you're looking at uh, redshifts of a thousand or so uh, when the universe, when the contribution of the vacuum energy was extremely low. Um, so there is very limited information on the dark energy from, from the CMB. There is some because the angular diameter distance to, uh, to the last scattering surface is uh, uh, dependent on the whole sort of history, if you like. So there, there is some dependence, but it's not very strong. So if you want to look in detail at the dark energy properties, then um, the CMB is, is a bit limited. So uh, you can do better with cosmic shear, uh, which measures, which is sensitive both to perturbations and to geometry. Uh, so this is the bending of light by the lumpy mass distribution as the light passes through. And you've seen better images than this showing the, uh, the distortion patterns around uh, rich clusters of galaxies. That's not the signal that we're interested in. We're interested in the very low level distortions that go across the whole sky. So even if you look at a, a, a blank, piece of sky, then the images will be distorted by around about 1%. Uh, so there's a very small distortion, but if you have a large enough set of galaxies and uh, with deep enough observations, then you can look statistically for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the signal, which tells you about how clumpy the universe was and how it growed in, how, how the clumpiness grew over time, which probes the perturbations. But also the angular scale on which you see the the uh, fluctuations probes the geometry as well. So it's in principle a very powerful test. It's also just gravity. Well, this is not quite quite true, but uh, you don't need to worry too much about the galaxy formation efficiency or galaxy bias or anything. We're really probing the mass distribution and not the distribution of light. So gravitational lensing uh, was uh, one of the predictions of Einstein's theory of relativity. His uh, an illustration of the first experiment to try to do it, the first successful experiment of Eddington's 1919 eclipse uh, expedition. This is a picture of the distribution of stars behind the sun uh, in one case, and with the, if you take the sun away, that's where the stars would be. Uh, here, the displacements have been expanded by a factor of 50 so that you can see them. But that's basically the signal that was looked for. And as you're all aware, it favored Einstein's theory over Newton's. And this is, Einstein was so pleased about it that he wrote a postcard to his mother. And this is a this is the, a picture of his postcard. Uh, it's, uh, it says, Liebe Mutter, so I'll translate it to you it's in, in German. Uh, Liebe Mutter, dear mother, um, Unfortunately, I don't speak German, so that's as much as I can <laughs> tell you, but, but he was really pleased. So what are the statistics that we typically use? So we normally use, um, uh, say, power spectrum statistics. I think in the interest of time, I'll perhaps won't go through the details here, but basically you measure, you measure the, uh, the, the clustering of the, of the distortion pattern and then compare it with theory, much the same way as, um, uh, as, as with the CMB, and this is the picture that shows shows the tension between uh, Planck and the uh, most of the uh, weak lensing surveys. So let, let me now just put this in a, a Bayesian context and see uh, w where we might be where we might be concerned and what we can do uh, what we might be able to do in, uh, in to, to 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 do this in a, a way which is. As, uh, as good a job as we can. 
Um, so the question that we're normally wanting to answer in this sort of problem is, is a parameter inference problem. So we have a model, lambda CDM or whatever, which has some parameters in it, theta, and we have some data. And this is the quantity that we usually are. So given the data that we have and any prior information that we have, uh, what is the probability distribution for the parameters? <clears throat> so we want to evaluate this quantity. We, it's called a posterior. Uh, it involves the likelihood or the sampling distribution, depending on how you view it, uh, and a prior on the parameters. And the Bayesian evidence on the model just normalizes this. It plays a role if you're comparing different models. Um, but if you're working within the context of a single model, it's these two things, the likelihood and the prior that, uh, that you need to specify. So traditional analysis is to take your data, uh, construct some summary statistics that are informed by your knowledge of the subject. So we know that the power spectrum, for example, is uh, 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 contains information about the things that we want. Uh, so we estimate the power spectrum and use that as our data. We always have the choice of what data we're going to analyze. Uh, so this is a sensible choice. Um, so uh, as I say, typically two point statistics, correlation functions, or power spectra. For Gaussian fields, these would contain, you know, essentially all of the information that's statistical information that's in the field. But the universe has undergone quite a lot of nonlinear evolution. So uh, there is more information than is in the power spectrum. So people then often uh, construct some other summary statistics that might be based on the three point function uh, or other other ways of probing the non-Gaussianity of the, of the field. But basically we choose some, you know, sensibly we choose some summary statistics uh, to analyze uh, because we can't analyze the whole data set. Well, perhaps we can, that would be nice. So what are the challenges of this? Well, the challenges um, are, well, firstly, we have to have a likelihood function and that may not be easy to, to write down um, do we know what the statistical properties of these things uh, are? Uh, the universe is pretty complicated. Um, so what we tend to do is to assume that these quantities have Gaussian distributions um, for which we then need a covariance matrix. So there's quite a lot of industry is thinking, how can we, how can we get the covariance matrix? Um, and that, that can be hard, and it may not be the full story anyway, because the statistics, the data that we have may not be a multivariate Gaussian distribution at all. Sometimes the central limit theorem helps you, but actually in many cases, the requirements of the central limit theorem are not satisfied with the data that we use. Uh, and I think for some of these, some of these statistics, the Gaussian distribution is pretty good, but for others, it's definitely not. Um, so we we just sort of hope that it's okay. And it's not as easy as you might think. So this is uh, an example of the, the correlation of the temperature, correlation function of the temperature of the CMB uh, as a function of the separation of two points um, on the sky. And this is from the WMAP data. Um, so here's the, the WMAP data. It's the black curve here. And the best fitting lambda CDM model is uh, uh, is the green curve, and you can see there's really good agreement. So it's quite clear that that you know that must be lambda CDM. It's such a good agreement, um, except of course it's not. And you know you 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 ask the question, well, what what how can how can this clearly very bad fit to the data uh, be consistent with uh, uh, with these two things being uh, uh, with these data having come from, from this model? And the answer is that the statistical properties of this statistic are complicated, and it's not difficult um, to get all of the points, the black points, to move up and down together. Right? So if you do pi squared by i, you'd say this is a terrible fit. Um, but to do the analysis, we, we need to we need the likelihood function. So we need the probability that all of these black points lie out here, given that the theory says that they should lie down here. 
And for this statistic, actually, the probability that they all lie high is not very small. Um, so you need to know the statistical properties of the data that you're uh, that you're analyzing. And uh, you know, this is a, I think, a salutary example that uh, you need to take you need to take care. So um, let me just give you a quick go through how you might be able to do this uh, in a nice way that has the advantage that it uses the uh, all of the, the information. So if we want to get as much information out of the data as possible, then let's make the data set the things that we actually measure. So let's say the if we measure the shapes of individual galaxies, if we're looking at say cosmic shear, that's the the things that get distorted. Uh, so if we if we try to write down the likelihood function for the raw data, it might be the number of galaxies or the positions of galaxies, uh, but it's basically not doing any form of data compression uh, as a as a as a start. Can we actually do it? Um, so. Let me just go very quickly through this just to say that, yes, you can do it in cosmological case because we understand quite a lot of what's going on. Uh, the posterior, which is the thing we're after, um, we can write it in terms of the true field. So if you think about, say, cosmic shear, we measure, we estimate the distortion in big pixels on the sky. Um, and those estimates, of the distortion are noisy. Uh, they're very noisy, in fact. Um, so we have a, a rather poor estimate of the distortion in each big pixel on the sky. But there is an underlying true distortion, um, which uh, is, is 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 part of the is, is sort of the real the the, the the real distortion. But we don't see it. We see only a very noisy version of it. But what we can do is to write down the posterior as just using the, the marginalization properties of, of, um, uh, of probability. Uh, we can write it as the, uh, the joint probability distribution of the parameters and the true shear field, uh, given the data, which is the noisy, noisy field. So these, uh, the true field is, uh, we call it latent variables. They're part of the data model, but they're not directly observed which is what, what this means. And then this joint distribution, well, we can just use the laws of probability to write this uh, as the probability of the data given the, for the noisy data, given the true shear field and the parameters. But in fact, this is just measurement noise. So um, this is uh, uh, this doesn't depend on the parameters, it just uh, depends on the, what the true field is. Uh, multiply by the probability of the uh, the true shear field given the parameters and then a prior. So the nice thing about this is that it then sort of divides the uh, the probabilities into into things that we have that we sort of understand because this is the this is the field level likelihood, which is just says if you if you've got a true true shear field and we measure a noisy version of it, then we we understand what that probability distribution is quite well. This part is theory and this is a prior. So you divide the variability in the whole thing into components, each of which you understand better, even if this object, the posterior, um, you can't you can't sort of immediately write down what the uh, what the probability is, but you can divide it in this way. And uh, I'll perhaps skip these things, but you can uh, uh, you can define uh, these. Um, uh, you, can, you can you can really write down what this is uh, as an integral. Um, and uh, we know what each of these things is, so we have a possibility of actually doing the, uh, calculating uh, calculating the posterior. The challenge of it is that this is a really high dimensional integral. <laughs> it might have ten million dimensions to to it, so it's hard. Um, what we do is to sample from this joint distribution, which has really high dimensionality, and we can do this with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling. Can also use Gibbs sampling in some uh, circumstances, uh, so it's actually not impossible to do this. Even though it sounds it sounds uh, really hard, it's hard, but it's not impossible. Um, so this is the essence of Bayesian hierarchical models, and it's um, uh, conceptually not very not very difficult, but uh, operationally quite uh, quite complicated. Um, so this is uh, what uh, 
my former postdoc, uh, Natalia Porcares, has been doing for weak lensing. Let me skip a bit because time's going on. But uh, the, the, the advantage of it is that by rather than compressing the data into some summary statistics to start with, we are really calculating the probability of the whole original data. So nothing gets thrown away. Uh, and we're sensitive to the two point function, the three point function, everything. Um, and uh, the payoff is that the uh, the posterior contours get much smaller than uh, than you get from traditional uh, two point statistics. Um, so this is uh, this is a promising way to go. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about simulation based inference, which is another way of doing a Bayesian analysis uh, of the of the data. <coughs> Um, if you want to avoid doing some very expensive computations, um, so we do, but we do both. But uh, this is, <clears throat> in some ways, more flexible, but uh, also has some challenges as well. It's not as uh, mature a field as the Bayesian hierarchical modeling, but it's bec becoming uh, more and more popular in a number of different fields. But I'm going to concentrate on uh, supernova cosmology for this. And the question is, well, what do you do if you've got no idea of what the likelihood function is? Um, so if you've got no idea of why you're, what the probability of measuring the data uh, is, uh, given any theory, uh, what can you do? Uh, it sounds very hard, but if you have a good simulator for the data, then you have a chance of, um, of being able to do something. So simulation-based uh, inference can, uh, can, can help. Um, there are some challenges, though. One is that the data size becomes very challenging. Uh, and as I say, we may start with a data size, which is 100 million or something. Uh, so uh, that is that is challenging. Um, and the other thing is that you end up with some rather high dimensional probability distributions, which are, can be difficult to characterize. So let me just give you a few de details on that. <clears throat> so here's, here's simulation-based inference 101. This is um, this is how it works. It's conceptually, it's not difficult at all. Uh, all the difficulty is in is uh, in in the implementations. Uh, let's imagine that we have a model that has a single parameter in it, theta, and we have one data point. We measure one thing, uh, and that measured value is 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 here. So, if we have a good simulator from the for the data, then what we can do is to uh, draw a value of the parameter from the from the from a prior, uh, run the simulator and generate our one data point. Let's say it comes up here. Um, then we do it again and again and again. We just keep on running the simulator, and we end up with this distribution. Let's say. <clears throat> so what the goal of our experiment is the posterior, which is the probability of the parameter theta, uh, given that the data is equal to the measured value. Um, so it's clear that what we want is actually the distribution of points along this line. Okay, so if you've got a good simulator, then any points that are along, along that line you keep, uh, and then you just look at the distribution of those, and that gives you the posterior. Of course, if it's a continuous variable, none of them will lie exactly on the line, so you have to widen it a little bit. Um, and if you just restrict yourself to the simulations that are close to the data, then that's called ABC, approximate Bayesian computation. You look at the histogram, and that's uh, that's it. It's it's easy. Um, <clears throat> so that's rejection sampling ABC. Um, what's the challenge? Well, here you you sort of see it that most of the simulations don't agree with the data, so very few of them do. And this is in one D or two D with the the two. Uh, one parameter and one data, uh, one datum. Um, it's clearly more challenging if you have more than one data point. If you have 10 data points, this is 11 dimensional. If you have 100 million, it's 100 million and one dimensional. So trying to populate that high dimensional space with simulations is clearly going to be impossible. And none of them will be close to, close to the data. Uh, just before we address the issue of the, of the the size of the data, um, if you you can do better than just doing rejection sampling, you can 
essentially fit the joint distribution of the data and the parameters with some sort of kernel density estimation. So you get a smooth fix to this, and then you can do a cut through that smooth distribution, and then you get, uh, you get this. So there's, there's various ways of doing that, which I won't uh, dwell on. Um, but uh, that's one place where machine learning can really help, essentially doing uh, uh, learning these uh, uh, multidimensional distributions. So the challenge is dimensionality. If we have, say, 10 million data points, say the pixel values in uh, a CMB map and six parameters, then this is a 10 million and six dimensional problem. Um, no simulated data sets are going to give a map that looks uh, pixel by pixel like the Planck map. So it's too demanding to say we, we have to simulate the exact universe. So let's be less ambitious and match the statistical properties only. So for example, let's have a look at the power spectrum. So this is an almost Gaussian field, so the power spectrum should contain most of the information. So you can ask, you can run the simulator and just keep those that, that have the blank power spectrum. But even that's too ambitious because that's 2000 numbers and you're not gonna get those 2000 numbers all agreeing for any simulation. Um, so 2,500 numbers. Um, so you have to compress things further. And that's where you can, you need really need extreme data compression. You need to reduce the dimensionality of this problem down to a handful of numbers or a few handfuls of numbers. So the question is, how can you do that in a, in, in a way that doesn't lose information? And uh, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. Um, one is an old technique from, from years ago called Moped. Um, and that is um, that you can compress the data down to, from whatever size it started with, down to the number of parameters that you have in your model. So in the example that I gave before, with six parameters, you would compress the entire CMB map down to six numbers. Uh, and the remarkable thing is that you can do that in a way which doesn't lose information about the parameters. So if you do that, that becomes a six plus six, a 12 dimensional joint distribution of data and parameters. And that's uh, that's doable, or it can be if your simulator is fast. Um, so no loss, loss of information and it's, uh, it's 12 dimensional. So this old technique, which was derived for a completely different purpose is now becoming interesting again because of SBI, that it's a way to reduce the dimensionality of a, of a, a data set down to um, to something manageable. Uh, time is getting on, so let me just, uh, let, let me show you why it works because it's, uh, it's trivially simple. Um, this is not how we derived it to start with. It was a much more complicated derivation, but then my former student, Justin Alsing and Ben Vandal, looked at the problem in a different way and it came out sort of embarrassingly trivially. So it's, it's, it's so easy, I'll just go through the argument here. So let's imagine that you have a Gaussian distribution of your original data. So this is the sampling distribution, data here, mean here, covariance matrix here. If we assume that the covariance matrix doesn't vary with the parameters, then the information is coming from, the information on the parameters is coming from the fact that the mean signal is varying with the parameters. So you saw the CMB power spectrum as the uh, energy density was, was changing. That's where the information comes from. And if you just do a linear Taylor expansion of the, uh, of the mean signal, uh, just a linear order expanded around some fiducial point in parameter space, plug that into the formula, you get this. So uh, it's straightforward. You have terms that involve P minus mu star. You also have some terms that involve the uh, theta minus the theta star uh, twice. And then there's the cross terms. So that just comes from multiplying everything out. Um, and the point is that the only bit that does any work here is the bit in the box. Um, so the red part doesn't depend on the parameters. So that is basically just a normalization constant in the, in the light period. 
So when you calculate the posterior, it actually normalizes out the term on the bottom. And the Bayesian evidence will cancel this term out. Uh, this does depend on the parameters, but it doesn't depend on the data. So the only place is where the data comes in and influences the, uh, the can influence the, the posterior is in this term here, which comes from the cross terms. Um, so it involves the derivative of the mean, it involves the covariance matrix uh, and, the, and the data here. But if you look at the dimensions of, of this thing, uh, that if you have, let's say, six parameters, that's just six numbers. So that's the only way that the data influences these things to the extent that the Taylor expansion is, is, is valid. Um, so you don't need the whole data set. You just need those six numbers. Uh, and that should give you uh, the same uh, inference. Uh, the other way that you can do it is to use neural networks to define um, summary statistics that are informative. And my student, Lucas Mackinnon, is uh, one of the experts in this. And this is uh, where you, uh, you just simply ask the neural network the question, let me give you the entire shear map of the universe. And uh, you tell me what six combinations of those pixel values are the most informative ones. And neural networks are good at, at optimizing things. And we find that it works uh, also works quite nicely. So uh, let me, I've, it's nearly 10 to, so let me just uh, wrap up. Um, so I'll skip these things. Um, just make one point in passing, which is that the, uh, so people are beginning to do, do this in various fields. In complicated fields, if you're involved in galaxy formation, then you have to be really careful because the, the different theoretical models give you different answers. So if you train on one, uh, one set of models and apply it to a different set of models, then you don't do terribly well. So our hope is that gravitational lensing is sufficiently simple because it doesn't involve complex galaxy formation physics to some degree, uh, that it will work uh, It will work nicely. Um, let me just finish by showing that how, how well it works if you, if you compress data down to the number of parameters. Um, so this is supernova cosmology with MOPED. Uh, there's three parameters in this problem. Omega of matter, the Hubble constant, and omega vacuum. Uh, so what you see here are the posteriors coming from the uh, Pantheon supernova data set for these three parameters. So there's actually two sets of posteriors on this uh, on this figure. Uh, one from the original 1,600 supernovae, and the other is from the three numbers that you get from moped compression. So the three numbers are in yellow there. If you use those three numbers as your data and you do the analysis, then you get the red contours. And if you use the full 1590 supernova, you get the blue contours. But you don't see the red and the blue, you only see purple because they're, they're basically identical. And uh, you can do SBI with these. Uh, and uh, you see agreement with the uh, using. Uh, doing doing a likelihood based uh, uh, method. Um, so it seems that if you if you demand only that the uh, these highly compressed statistics are um, uh, are uh, agree with the from the simulations agree with the data, then you can do just as good parameter inference as using the entire data set, which is really uh, promising for SBI because it means that we can. We can really uh, work with low dimensional um, uh, SBI and it works. So uh, I've put too much in this talk, so sorry, but just to say that you can do model comparison as well. I'll skip this slide, but I'll just, uh, just summarize. Um, yep, so I think that's, that's uh, about it, which sorry to have gone on slightly too long, but I'll stop and answer questions. Uh, any questions? Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. We, uh, 
uh, I was wondering if you wanted to fit a completely wrong model to the um, uh, to the uh, ontological data. But to the ways with the six reduced statistical numbers that, that we could use, would that be possible? Um, so it is possible. There are some sort of edge cases where you could uh, you could you could get that agreement. Um, but uh, it usually requires some strange degeneracies in the data that uh, it's so uh, with gravitational wave data, you can get that happening where you, well, I tell you, that's not um, that's not a completely wrong model, but that's uh, a model that uh, is where the parameters you get degeneracies in the parameters where if you use the full data set, everything, you can infer the correct parameters. If you use the compressed data, then you can get you can get agreement with the three numbers, but not with the original data set. Um, it's actually quite easy to deal with that problem. You can uh, run with a different fiducial model, or else you can do a single full likelihood evaluation at each point, and it'll tell you which of your solutions is the right one. Um, the question of whether you can get the wrong model. Well, uh, actually, the, the 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 slide that I skipped uh, shows that. Oops, where is it? Um, that you can do the model comparison. Where's it gone? There we go. There's a way to use this extreme data compression, uh, and uh, you can do model comparison. So you can. Uh, you can do the same thing that you would do with the full data set, which is, again, another expensive calculation, which is to work out the, the probability of the data, the full data set given the model. Um, and this works just as well in that circumstance. If you, if, you, uh, if you use the three numbers as using the full data set, then you can, you can, uh, you can decide uh, which, of the, um, uh, which of the models is correct. So, um, so even if you could get this exactly the same, I'd have to think about it. I think you, it, it, it's not inconceivable, but it's very difficult to do, I think is probably the, the okay. answer to get through. Um, we haven't come across any circumstances where it, where that's happened. Just a follow up. Mm -hmm. But a priori, you wouldn't know, right? Um, you would have to do the full data set in order to be sure. Uh, let's see. Would you? I mean, I can't exclude the possibility that a model would give you these three numbers, but um, but how would you discover it? Let's see. Um, I mean, my guess is that uh, as with uh, most model comparison things that you, where there's a combination of how good is your fit and how finely do you need to tune the parameters to get that number, to get the, a good fit. So I, I suspect that probably what, what would happen here is that if, if you could find some parameters in a completely wrong model that gave you the exactly those three numbers or very close to those three numbers that you might have to fine tune the, the parameters really precisely. So I think when you, if you if you do a Bayesian evidence calculation, I suspect that you would probably get penalized because you had to do a lot of fine tuning to, to get that wrong model to to fit the uh, fit data. But it's uh, but I can't exclude it as a as a possibility in general. I think. So you mentioned that these absolute physically motivated summary statistics uh, have these errors that are difficult that can be difficult and non trivial to understand. So I was wondering for the modern methods of statistical inference, do summary statistics like this still have a role or is it better to uh, either use the full data or uh, use these, this compressed method? Of so, you know, traditional summary statistics absolutely have a role. I mean, the, the, the um, uh, one of the advantages is that they're computationally much quicker to analyze than these. So. Uh, so these things would not be the first things that I would do. <laughs> um, it's uh, because they 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 are computationally heavy. 
Um, so yeah, so using summary statistics and making the assumptions of Gaussianity to start with still makes perfect sense. But um, but I would say that then one wants to do, you know, something like these techniques to uh, to, to to go further, um, and uh, they would allow you also to 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 check you know whether the assumptions that are made in the in the traditional summary statistics are, are valid or not so just just to follow up um so if you are using summary traditional summary statistics how would you handle these uh complex quadrillion statistics they have yeah so so that can be extremely challenging because you can um uh if you're, if you're using two point statistics as your data set then the covariance properties depend on the four point function which for the degree of nonlinearity that's in the present day universe is is really challenging to to compute so analytically it's very difficult um you can use simulations so it's another simulation based method but you need a lot of simulations. Uh, and this is, again, is where this extreme data compression can help you a lot, because if you, you, you need more simulations than you have data points. Um, so for Euclid, for example, with weak lensing tomography going across many different redshift slices and many different measurements within each redshift slice and cross terms, there could be many thousands of summary data so you need then you need many thousands of simulations which are expensive to do for that volume. Um, so that's another place where if you do extreme data compression, then you can reduce the uh, the number of simulations that you need down to a manageable number. Mm -hmm. Hubble, thank you. Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, it, it it's I I'm, and the reason for saying that is is they are, um, um they're coming from from a observational point of view they're they're completely separate and I think from a theoretical point of view there's uh, uh I'm not sure if there are any really satisfactory explanations for either of them but there aren't any as that I'm aware of that solve both of them at once that would be. That would be quite nice if there was if there was one, but uh, very often if you try to uh, get rid of the Hubble tension, it makes the SA tension worse. So, yeah, so I, I mean, my suspicion, I have my own suspicions. I think for the lensing, the redshift distribution is quite difficult to get because it's all photometric redshifts. Um, for the Hubble thing, I I'm conscious that the tip of the red giant branch doesn't give as big attention as the Cephes. Um, so if you pressed me, I would say, I still think the Cephe calibrations are, may, may not be, may, maybe we don't understand those as well as, as, as we would like to, but I might be wrong. <laughs> Um, does it depend on the data being normal? So uh, that's an interesting question. So yes, in terms of the way that it gives you the summary statistics, yes, it makes that assumption. Um, the 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 nice thing about it is that if you then use those summary statistics in SBI, you no longer um, need to assume that it's Gaussian because you learn the distribution actually from from SBI. You learn the uh, the sampling distribution and it, it it doesn't have to be Gaussian. Um, so those those plots, elliptical plots. If you if you do a horizontal slice, it gives you the posterior. If you do a vertical slice, it gives you the the likelihood function or the sampling distribution. So uh, so the only price that you pay is that if it's not Gaussian distributed, then your data compression will not be perfect and it won't be optimal. But those compressed summaries are still likely to be highly informative. Just maybe not quite the best that you could, in principle, get. Thanks. Sorry, it's longer than I was.